Hello, thanks for coming. Um, if you went to the Great Salt Lake Issues Forum, I'm sorry because this is a different topic. So there's there's a one on Utah Lake happening at the same time. If you don't want to listen to an example, which <laughs> so I changed my talk today to 20 years of managing and conserving the avian and aquatic communities of Great Salt Lake because that is what our program, Great Salt Lake Ecosystem Program, does, and not a lot of people know about us or know what we do. So I'm hoping that you're able to walk out of here knowing the evolution of our program, how it started, and where we are today. So I'm going to tell a little story here. The first chapter I titled Growth, and that's because in the 1980s, and particularly in the 1990s, there was an exponential increase in the human population. Um, this led to a substantial growth of the world economy and international trade. Because of this growth, um, there, were, there was a higher demand for food. And in particular, people wanted high quality protein. So this demand for more food, coupled with an increase in international trading, allowed things like the aquaculture industry to boom, but also, um, or sorry, I was supposed to say um, agriculture, <laughs> but also aquaculture grew. And if you don't know what that is, it's the farming of aquatic organisms such as fish, crustaceans, mollusks, and aquatic plants. This graph is provided by the FishSat database and shows aquaculture production and wild capture in millions of tons. And as you can see in this period of time, we started to see a lot more aquaculture production happening. To give an example of this, we have seen growth since then at 8% annually, and it's projected to grow into the future according to the Food and Agriculture Organization. And to put it in perspective, currently almost half of our seafood comes from aquaculture production and fish farms. So one of the major products of fish farms is what we call the table shrimp. The reason why this is particularly relevant to Great Salt Lake is because about 75% of them are produced in Asia, particularly in China and Thailand, in these fish farms. This graph is, represents the giant tiger prawn in production in tons. In 1981, you can see they were producing just 21,000 tons. By 1988, 200,000 tons were being produced. And by the end of the 90s, over 500,000 tons of giant tiger prawn were being produced. So the reason why this is super important is because in order to raise table shrimp, they are fed Great Salt Lake brine shrimp. They're also fed brine shrimp from other salt lakes, but in particular at this time, it was most likely going to be from Great Salt Lake due to not as much competition around the world. So this can represents a one pound can of brine shrimp cysts. If you don't know what cysts are, they look something like this, and they're brine shrimp eggs. But what makes them unique is they have this really hard outer shell. It allows them to withstand extreme conditions like extreme drought or freezing winter temperatures. And that is what makes them cysts versus brine shrimp eggs. Brine shrimp eggs don't have that thick outer shell. So they're able to be put in that can I showed you, taken out of the lake, put in commercial dryers, shipped all over the world in cans like that, and then re hatch out into living brine shrimp and fed to table shrimp and other fish um, in order to raise them as fish farms. Great Salt Lake brine shrimp cysts are also known for their high quality. If you don't know what this means, it just means that when you buy a can of those brine shrimp cysts, you're going to have a really high percentage that hatch out into adult brine shrimp. So you're going to have high hatchability which is a really good product and what people want. So people saw an opportunity to start harvesting these brine shrimp cysts out of Great Salt Lake. A lot of people were coming from Colorado, from running rivers, but there was also a large percentage of people coming from the oceans and commercial fisheries. These commercial fisheries men came from highly regulated fisheries um, and brought with them knowledge and understanding that fisheries can collapse. So they knew that there had to be regulation on Great Salt Lake if they wanted to have a future of harvest. 
also at this time in the news, there was um, a lot of talk about the collapse of the Great Atlantic Cod Stacks in 1992. Um, as you can see, the cod stacks pretty much were decimated from overharvest, and a lot of people lost their jobs, and a lot of money was lost in the end. So the harvesters did not want the same thing to happen on Great Salt Lake. They, they took in a rather unusual step at this time and actually called the state of Utah to ask for regulation on Great Salt Lake. And I changed it to this phone because it's more historically relevant at the time. Um, they called the state of Utah with some main concerns. The first was they wanted additional law enforcement to ensure all harvesters were abiding by the rules, kind of like we heard this morning on the Hudson River where they had a patrol boat. They wanted that out there to make sure the rules that were in place were actually being followed. And they also wanted to understand the brine shrimp population in order to ensure a sustainable harvest in the future. So relatively quickly after this, by 1994, the Division of Wildlife has established a law enforcement presence on Great Salt Lake. And everybody seemed pretty happy with this outcome, but the second of understanding the brine shrimp population was going to be a much more difficult endeavor. So one of the first steps that the division took was hiring a Great Salt Lake expert and researcher, and inevitably they decided to go with Dr. Gary Golovsky, who at the time was at Utah State University. His first tasks were to develop a simple ecosystem model for Great Salt Lake, and then also look at brine shrimp reproduction and their functional response to varying salinities, water temperatures, and food base in the lab. So the model Gary wanted to create was eventually going to be comparing fall cysts um, per liter, the density of cysts in the lake, and spring cysts. And he wanted to find a minimum number of spring cysts left after the harvest to ensure that we had enough in the fall for continued reproduction of the system. But in order to get this, Gary needed data. Meanwhile, there is more and more people flocking to Great Salt Lake. And the increase in competition was worrying the harvesters that there still would be an overharvest because we still didn't have any data. So the harvesters and the division sat down and decided to cap the CORs at 79 cents. If you don't know what a COR is, it's just a license to harvest brine shrimp out of Great Salt Lake. You can think of it as an expensive fishing license. So by the early 90s, um, the harvesters agreed to raise the price of their licenses to $10,000 from $1,000 and to use extra funds to research and regulate the Great Salt Lake. So it's really important to point out here that without the brine shrimp industry agreeing to do things like regulate themselves and raise the price of their own licenses, our program, the Great Salt Lake Ecosystem Program, would not be possible. There are also concerns um, about this increase in competition for brine shrimp cysts being taken out of the lake that, that might affect the birds that rely on brine shrimp as a food resource. In particular, at the time, the Great Salt Lake Autobahn was expressing concern for the eared greed. So eared greed comes, comes here in like large numbers. Last year, I believe, we estimated about 5 million of them came to Great Salt Lake. And when they get here, they rely on brine shrimp as a food resource. Because when they arrive, they begin to molt, lose their feathers, and it change their entire physiology so they can gain enough weight for the rest of their migration. So if they were to come and there weren't enough brine shrimp in the lake, they wouldn't be able to just fly away and go find food somewhere else. So at this point, everybody sat around and decided they needed to do more. A lot of groups got together and sat down and decided the only way to really go about this is to protect the ecosystem of the Great Salt Lake, because the ecosystem is what keeps the go harvest going in the first place. So the basis of protecting the Great Salt Lake, and not just the brine shrimp, but the entire ecosystem, was the basis behind our project and why on July 1st, 1996, the Great Salt Lake Ecosystem Project was started. So at this time, we were just a project, not a program, and we had a project leader and an avian biologist. So the next chapter of this story I titled Into the Unknown because I wanted to point out that no one else in the world had ever, ever undertaken an endeavor like this before. 
there hadn't been a brine shrimp harvest on a Great Salt Lake to this magnitude, and no one had had to manage anything quite like it. So they were faced with many tasks once GSLEP was created. One of the first ones to develop the structure of staffing an initial meeting of our TAG team. So these TAG meetings are a technical advisory group that gets together, and their mission was to suggest topics to be researched, provide input on existing research, and advise on the priority of research. The structure of TAG was to meet quarterly. We meet three times a year now. Focus on research updates. And in fact, there was only one rule I was told at these TAG meetings and that there is no rule named. Um, it was going to be strictly about biology and research of Great Salt Lake. The next task was to determine the initial research needs and hire expert researchers. Determining the initial research needs was being met in part by TAG, but also by our expert researchers. So Dr. Gary Belovsky, one of the first things that he did was did a literature search on Great Salt Lake and other lakes that have brine shrimp harvest. Unfortunately, he didn't find that much, and it wasn't because he didn't look very hard. It was because not a lot of previous research has been completed on managing a brine shrimp harvest before. So with that, they knew they had a lot to do. So at this point, GSLEP hired an aquatic biologist to add to the team, an expert bird researcher, Dr. Mike Conover from Utah State University, and his question was going to be, was the harvest affecting ear grebe rely on brine shrimp as a food resource? Because this was one of the main and important things they wanted to look at. So at this point, GSLEP had a project leader, an avian biologist, an aquatic biologist, a contract with a brine shrimp researcher, Dr. Gary Belowski, a bird researcher, and then they contracted with a limnology researcher from USGS. So a pretty well-rounded team was being made. And the next step was to determine the appropriate harvest levels that would sustain the ecosystem. So before we had this model, GSLOP managed the harvest similar to commercial fisheries. And we had been keeping track of how many pounds of fish were taken out of the lake through the years. And in 95, 96, we saw it reach 14.749 million pounds. So when it reached around the same amount in 96, 97, we decided to stop the harvest because it had reached that level before and recovered. And we really had no data to say otherwise. But we knew that we wanted to manage the harvest using a minimum number of fish left in the lake because it would be much more reliable. And then stop the harvest when we reached that brine shrimp density. So using extreme caution and professional prudence, a lot of scientists and researchers got together, looked at some previous literature, and decided that around 21 cysts per liter needed to be left in the lake to ensure regeneration of the population into the future. Once the lake reached this density, the harvest would be stopped. So how are they getting the brine shrimp densities in the first place? Well, they had to develop a sampling regime to gather brine shrimp density data out of Great Salt Lake. Luckily, um, with the money from the harvesters, we were able to get a boat. We have something that looks like this still. Because this is how they were sampling the lake before, and it wasn't that efficient, and we weren't going to be able to get enough good data using a rod. We also were able to take over USGS's sampling regime of the lake. They had already had one in place. The way that they set it up was putting a numbered grid over Great Salt Lake, and then using a random number generator, they picked sampling sites throughout the lake to get a good idea of what was going on in the shallow parts and the deep parts. So right now we have 17 sample sites. We have had up to 21 when the lake is higher. It's about a 120 mile round trip, and it takes about eight to 10 hours. We do this once a week from October to January during the harvest season and bi-weekly the rest of the year. Um, when we go out, it looks something like this. We take a brine shrimp net haul to get the water column, and we spray everything down into there, end up bringing something back to our lab that looks like this. From this, we're able to get brine shrimp densities by age class. We get how many males per liter, females, U1, 
juvenile brine shrimp, nauplii, which are baby brine shrimp, and then the sick. It has been a, uh, we've been able to get a more refined look at the brine shrimp life cycle on the lake because of this. While we're out there, we also collect the pH, dissolved oxygen, salinity, and temperature, as well as phytoplankton. Phytoplankton samples get sent to Dr. Kolovsky, who's now at Notre Dame, and he speciates it and then uses the phytoplankton to check the response of brine shrimp to different forage bases, which has allowed us to see what nauplii juvenile and adults prefer and what they survive best on. We're now using brine shrimp density data to add to the model. We have found a relationship between harvest and spring fish production percent. Um, we're also looking at the deep brine layer that um, is caused by the causeway being open. So while we're out there, we take temer samples and we look at the characteristics of the deep brine layer and the deep brine shrimp input. I was just told I have five minutes, so I'm going to try to keep this really quick. But we've become efficient at sampling and enumeration while finding a relationship with the model. Um, this is what it looks like now. We have a lot more points on it, but it's a really strong pairwise regression that we found. Um, as you can see, the fall spring um, cysts are predicted by the spring cysts, and it actually ended up being around 26 cysts per liter that need to be left in the lake, which is really close to our original guess of 21 cysts per liter. So now we have a project leader, an avian biologist, three aquatic biologists, and two to three seasonal technicians as needed. This allows us to have someone driving the boat while someone's counting brine shrimp cysts, someone sampling it out on the lake. And we've been able to gather data in real time, which allows us to relate brine shrimp densities to lake conditions and to better manage the harvest while allowing USGS to gather additional data instead of having to do what we took for granted. We do a lot of cool things with birds as well. I don't have time to talk about them, but our bird expert from Utah State has finished four PhD students, and we're starting another student to look at ear grebes. We're also doing airboat surveys on the lake to look at shorebirds. We're studying the American white pelican population on Neptune Island, and we do ATV surveys on the shore to get an idea of the birds utilizing different areas of Great Lakes. So if you remember the book that was empty at the beginning, um, now we can fill pages upon pages with peer-reviewed published literature on Great Salt Lake, as well as reports that have been written on the birds and the brine shrimp, phytoplankton, chemistry. Um, it's pretty amazing. If you just check Google Scholar, there's a lot more to find. Um, we know cool facts like ear grebes consume 27 to 30,000 brine shrimps per day. Uh, White-faced ibis, we have a t about 27,000 breeding adults, which is 20% of the Western population. We know that approximately four generations of brine shrimp per each year. And yeah, to brine fry larval densities from June to October can range from 2,500 to 13,000 pounds of shrimp. We've seen harvest total stabilize, and in fact, we the record of 32 million pounds of cysts being taken out of the lake, 2013-2014. This has all been a direct effect of people working together, many different entities. And if my boss could add anything onto our boat for what we stand for, he would add cooperation. Because without cooperation among all these different entities, we would not be as successful as we are today. We get calls from all over the world asking us how we do what we do. Really quickly, some indirect effects I think are really funny. We've traveled about 78,600 miles on our g slap boat, which is equivalent to 3.1 times around the Earth. I'll skip this part so you can keep plugged in. Um, we've spent about um, 1.2 years on the boat, which is only using two people. We usually have three, and we do a lot more than just brine shrimp. So all of this is just our brine shrimp sampling. We've taken about 11,700 net haul samples, which is equivalent to 55,700 hours of counting dots in the lab, which is 6.36 years. So it's not over yet. My ending remarks are we still face many challenges. We all know that the lake has been drying up. 
which exposes a lot of the lake bed, making us wonder if we're losing cysts to the shore. We also have to deal with increase in salinity and warmer water temperatures. So we still have a lot to learn, and I am happy to pass it by over to you. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Ashley. Any questions? Questions for Ashley? Questions? We don't think so because they have gotten a lot better at what they do. So they used to just harvest from the shore, and then they got better technology and they could harvest from the lake, and they've just gotten better and better at it. So I don't know if there's really a correlation. Mm -hmm. More questions? Um, Could you repeat the question so everyone can hear? Oh, she was wondering if we've seen the bird populations go up and down, or are they pretty stable? And I know we've seen eared grebes go up, but that's it's along the same lines as the harvest question. We've gotten better at doing our aerial surveys. We have better photographs, so it's hard to say. Um, I think John Neal, our avian biologist, would be able to better answer that. Okay, question. Op uh, optimum salinity for brine shrimp is 13 to 15 percent. We're at around 16 percent right now. More questions for Ashley? The brine shrimp counting? Uh, so I don't know. About question that, is about actually. remote sensing. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. I'll have to look into it. Um, I was wondering how much the salinity has been going up over these past drought years, if it's like dramatic or just a little bit. Uh, right now it looks like just a little bit. Um, I actually just made a graph recently of every year and some of the ones that were low weren't just because they were a long time ago. So it does fluctuate a lot, but we have been seeing the winter temperatures starting in January be higher than they usually are. Is the harvesting done mainly south of the causeway or north of the causeway? They only harvest south of the causeway, and the harvesting that they do north is on the shore or from the pond. Okay, any more questions for Ashley? I think it was a Great presentation. I appreciate the graphics and the effort there. It was quite nice. So, um, any more questions or we're done? How about a big hand for Ashley? Thank you, everyone. <laughs>